Reach me that chair, Darren. My pastor, Dr. Lester Sumrall, early on in his ministry some 60 years ago, found himself in the jungles of Central America. While he was there, he came across a witch doctor. The witch doctor was taking human blood, mixing it together with alcohol, pouring it into the mouth of a satanic bullfrog. Close the mouth of the frog, dance around and whirl and make satanic incantations. Then open the mouth of the frog and drink the mixture back out. My pastor didn't do what most pastors today would do. He didn't walk up to that man and say, by the way, next Tuesday, we can schedule an appointment for you at 2 o'clock in the afternoon with a staff psychiatrist at the church. He walked up to where that witch doctor was, slapped his hands on the sides of his head, and said, Come out! Everybody shout, Come out! We didn't come tonight to play with the devil. We didn't come tonight to play church. We didn't come tonight to patty cake. We didn't come tonight to watch some puppet placate the people's passions. We did not come in this house tonight to construct for ourselves some little token God in our own mind and intellect which would become conducive to the lifestyle which we have predisposed ourselves to live. If you did, you're in the wrong building. That witch doctor fell over with a thud on the ground. He got up a moment later, prayed the sinner's prayer, was baptized in the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues. My pastor went back to the home that he was staying in. At that time, they didn't have beautiful hotels like the bishop has been so kind to put me in this day. Went back to the home, had no air conditioning, lay down in his against the wall. Pulled the covers up over himself and began to go to sleep. When suddenly the windows that were hanging, the curtains hanging over the windows began to flap and stick straight out. A horrible dark cloud filled the room. An eerie damp coldness ached in his bones. And the bed that he was lying in began to shake violently up and down. It shook so violently that it moved all the way out into the middle of the floor. That's when my pastor raised up in the bed and said, I recognize you, devil. I cast you out once today. I cast you out once. I can cast you out again. Now in the name of Jesus, go from me. He said immediately, the bed settled down in the middle of the floor. The curtains lay back against the wall. The coldness left the room. Now right there is where I'm getting out of my bed. I'm doing the best dance I can around the bed. I'm going to ride the book. I'm going to try to get in Charisma magazine. You know, if what was written on the back of preacher's books was really true, we'd went to heaven about 25 years ago. It's just a joke, people. I mean, right there, I mean, you call everybody in town when God heals you of a cold. Your bed hadn't shook out in the middle of the floor yet. He cast that thing out again. I'd have written a book about it. But that's the reason he's 82 and I'm 30-something. He raised back up in the bed and said, Get back in here. Get back in here. He said all of a sudden the bed started shaking again. Curtain stuck out. Cold, damp feeling filled the room. And with his bed shaking and trembling, he said, Devil, when I came in here, my bed was against that wall. Now, in the name of Jesus, put it back. 
up, he said, the bed move across the wall. Then he said, now you get out of here. Let me tell you tonight, we didn't come to, we did not come to Charleston, West Virginia, just to make the devil leave. We came in here tonight to make him put it back. Get on your feet and shout it. Put it back. Put a joy back. Give a job back. Give us Holy Ghost auction again. Give us preachers that can preach. Give us deacon can pray. Put our kids back. Put our money back. Put our health back. Put our revival back. Give our city back. Give our teenagers back. Devil, put it. Shout and praise him. Shout it. My God, we got the devil on the run. Shout it again. Put it back. Your finger and shout, put it back. Put it back. It's time somebody put their plate down, stomped their foot on the ground, pointed their finger under the nose of the devil, and said, We're not just playing at this thing. We are the born again, fire baptized, elect church of God, and we're not just about ready to back up for you. Be seated. If you have a now, you have to stay with me because I start fast.
I want to see heaven come down and kiss the earth. I'm weary with gospel politics and Christian entertainers. I'm tired. Am I the only one in the house that's tired? You can be seated. Huh? I'm doing my best to get to the text. Folk lying in the hospital dying and committees on committees getting together to have a committee meeting to elect the chairman of the committee so they can take some poses. Honey, by the time you get there, the poor man's dead. I want to see some signs. I want to see some wonders. I want to see some miracles. anybody hungry anybody thirsty for the things of God tired of borderline milk sop milk toast evangelicalism tired tired of Pentecost so called Pentecostal preachers that when they get on TV, you can't tell them from the Catholics or the Southern Baptists. I'm tired. I'm tired. You ain't got the same Holy Ghost I got if you're ashamed of it. I can just tell you that right now. You ain't got what I got. You ain't drank what I drank. You haven't eaten what I've eaten. You watch Breakthrough, honey. If we talk in tongues in church, we talk in tongues on TV. If we pray for the sick in church, we pray for the sick on TV. If we preach this gospel on church, we preach it on TV. If we cast out devils. I didn't say counsel them out or put them in a bag. I said cast them out. We don't need social reform in America. There's a devil loose. We don't need economic reform. There's a devil loose. We don't need political reform. There's a devil loose. We need to deal with the devil. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just stirred up. I just tell you right now, the anvil of truth has sustained itself under the deadening blow of the God haters since time immemorial. If this thing's ever stopped, it's not going to be from outside. It's not going to be the pornographers that stop it. Or Jack Daniels and Mogan David Concord Grape. It's not going to be Ted Turner that stops it. It's not the atheist shaking his fist in the face of God. That's a problem today. Far more reprehensible is the so-called Christian who despite his outward demeanor and Hart Schaffner and Mark suit and Liz Claiborne dress is a verifiable stranger to the actual character of the God he covenants that he serves. And I'm tired. You don't have to like me. You didn't pay my way. I came out of the locusts and out of the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey and you didn't pay for them. Are you listening to me? I'm not up here to, to regurgitate to you what I found on somebody else's cassette tape. been to the mountain I've walked in his presence I, I've got a word from God the book said you got a lot of instructors but you got few fathers father is responsible for provision and protection that means he's got to tell the truth 
shout the truth. Never in any generation in the history of the church have we ever boasted so much and produced so little. Am I preaching right yet? Your Bible says in Ezekiel chapter number 9, He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice saying, Cause them that have charge over the city. I'm so tired of this little charismaniac dancing. and Tired of that. We are an army. You look like Gomer Pyle is what you look like. Do you shout back there? Oh, Brother Rod, we're taking our city. You ain't won your family yet. I like how you're shouting now. So they cried in mine ears, them that have charge over the city draw near and every man bring his blessing one. No, your Bible says his destroying weapon. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate which lieth toward the north and every man his slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen with a rider's inkhorn by his side and he went in and stood beside the brazen altar and the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub upon he was to the threshold of the house. Say it starts in the house. And he called to the men clothed with linen, which had the rider's ink on by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of them that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Your Bible in 1 Peter chapter 4 says, For the time has come. Look at somebody next to you and just say, It's time. You don't have to look it up. Just say, It's time. Do you believe it's time? I think it's time. I'm ready for it. Are you ready for it? Are you sure you're ready for it? Whatever it is that God says it's time for, are you ready for it? Are you sure whatever God wants to do, you're you're ready to say, yes, Lord, yes, and now, Lord, now, and me, Lord, me. Are you ready for that? Are you ready? Do you believe it's time? You sure? Well, we better finish the verse. Because your Bible says it's time that judgment begin. The shouts are getting weaker. I said it's time that judgment begin at the house of God. Are you still ready? You see, in order to have an impact on our society, God tonight in Charleston is calling the body of Christ to rise far above the status quo of church normalcy. We've lived in a society where right has been wrong for so long that righteousness has become the abnormal thing. God commended the church and Revelation at Thyatira because they had not experientially known nor come into the depths of Satan. You see, the devil does have that inner circle of darkened hearts to whom he has imparted the mystery of iniquity and the depths of degradation. Over a period of time, these doctors of damnation have worked like leaven, permeating the mindset of the body of Christ to the point that we now call evil good and good evil. We live in a society 
that preserves the whale and murders its children. Is anybody in the house? We have the technology and know-how to build solid and strong houses and have weak, sick homes. We're smarter but not wiser. We know more and we understand less. We go faster but we end up nowhere. We have the power to conquer space and walk on the moon. We talk in tongues and can't conquer our habits. It's all right. It's going to get worse. God told Jeremiah, cheer up. It's going to get worse. We preserve the whooping crane and the spotted owl and take our children, tear them limb from torso, put them in the afternoon trash, and sing, I am the seed of Abraham. Therefore, doors been opened. Say a door's opened. For the spirit of Antichrist to use demon spirits. Wrecking havoc, killing and stealing and destroying. From international mad men like Saddam Hussein to the polished politicians of Charleston propagating perverted legislation which is anti-God and anti-church. To the street punk with an assault rifle to the so-called solid citizen who shakes his fist at the commandments of a holy God. All the demonically deranged devotees of hardcore Satanism that come to us from the ranks of politicians and housewives and doctors and preachers. All of this onslaught of evil going on around us and we cannot tonight put ourselves in a little spiritual cocoon. That's the problem with the church. We shout our shout and dance our dance and look for another blessing box to read what blessing can come upon us world around us is splitting the smoke-filled corridors of the devil's perdition wide open to spin not a day not a week no stay of execution to spin the endless ages of eternity in the devil's darkened abyss all of this onslaught of evil is too sinister and subtle to be of human origin it must be and is the carefully calculated conspiracy of demon spirits I'm gonna preach I got no intention of anything else You shouted a minute ago, you wanted. You're not like that other bunch that shouts just as long as it's what they want, are you? Because you see, that's been the problem with humanity from the dawn of creation. We've always thought we knew what was right. I'm here to tell you tonight, you don't know from Tuesday what's right. It's only he that knows what's right. We've got children living in our homes, populating our schools and attending our churches that are driven daily with demonic spirits. Oh, I know what we call it. We call it a dysfunctional home. Liar, liar. Your Bible calls it a generational curse. Public education used to have three R's. Does anybody know what they are? Do you know what they are? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. Now they have four. Reading, writing, arithmetic, and reproductive rights. Instead of teachers passing out convictions, they're passing out condoms and using your tax dollars to fund it.
Now, Paul said the reason this kind of thing would be possible would be because men would give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You know, in America, we've taken the bypass. Now, there's only one way out of bondage. It's straight out. A lot of folk hung up on the clover leaf. They just keep going round and round, round and round, go fast and end up nowhere. Do a lot of shouting, but still not free. Make a lot of commotion, walk right out the building and slap their wife. Just smile at me, it'll make me feel more comfortable. We've taken the bypass, haven't we? A murderer is no longer a heinous criminal. He's a media event. Oh, watch, here's the one I like. He's just a, I like this. I'm in, I'm in the right house for this. He, he's just a victim of society. Liar, liar. He's just the wrong color. He just didn't right have the right socioeconomic educational opportunity. Liar, liar. Nehemiah was born on the wrong side of the tracks and didn't even speak the language. And God used him to rebuild the broken down walls of the city of Jerusalem. Somebody ought to be shouting. Don't you let the devil sell you that lie? He just didn't have the right economic opportunity. You know what they blame it on poverty. Don't blame it on poverty. Some of us in this building were raised so far back in the woods we had to use hoot owls for roosters. You understand what I'm talking about. We didn't murder anybody. Talk to me, Shirley. She knows what it's like when June bugs don't show up till August. <laughs> Raised so poor, she couldn't pay attention. She didn't murder anybody. It's not an economic problem. It's not an educational problem. There's a devil loose. <laughs> Adultery is no longer sin in Hollywood or in 90% of the church. A liar is not a sinner. He's simply an extrovert with a lively imagination. We're living in a nation with a welfare system that legitimizes by paying money for illegitimacy. Something's wrong. There's a devil loose and it's only the church that can make a difference. So because of all that mess, rebellion against church leaders seems almost justified. Temptation to withdraw from fellowship is strong. Irritation levels are high and patience is low. And when you see all that happening, know this, the devil has come in great wrath. Bombarding your mind with a multiplicity of inordinate fears. Grotesque images flashing and burning in your imagination. Draining you from restful and peaceful sleep. Leaving you feeling disoriented and more confused. Carrying in your countenance a, a dark cloud of oppression. Can I say this? When you see these things come to pass, know that Satan has come to take your life. But I got good gospel news for you tonight. It don't matter what it looks like, feels like, tastes like, doesn't matter what they told you, doesn't matter what's going on around you. There's still tonight a God that creates, there's a king that redeems, there's a cross that bleeds, there's a prayer that is heard and answered, and there is still a triumphant, victorious church of Jesus.
Jesus Christ, against which the very gates of hell shall not prevail. Now the thief came. But for to kill and to steal and to destroy this thing that we're in called the church was not born in weakness. It was birthed on an explosion of unprecedented proportion. Inside 20 years, 120 people were loosed outside of an upper room. And inside 20 years, they had evangelized the known world without a television, without a radio, without a printed page. They didn't even have a Bible. Birthed in power, Peter's shadow, Paul's handkerchiefs and aprons, Stephen's signs and wonders, Paul's shipwreck and snake bite. My question is simply, and it's an aching question. I, I don't say it in anger, but in anguish. Where has our power gone? Where is it? I need it. Belshazzar thought that he could drink from golden goblets and touch the sanctified thing. But your Bible said that night, the enemies invaded the land. That night, shout that night. That night the river dried up. That night, that night, Belshazzar died. Samson lifted the gates of the city and carried them to the top of the hill upon his shoulder. Tired firebrands in the foxes' tails and loosed them through his enemy's camp. Samson, with the jawbone of an ass, slayed a thousand Philistines, but lay his head in the lap of Delilah went where he had no business going looked at what he had no business looking at heard what he had no business hearing saw what he had no business seeing and when you go where you should go and hear what you shouldn't hear and see what you should not see mark it down my friend you will end up doing what you should not do Where's your power, Samson? Well, it's here. Well, it's there. Playing and taunting with the devil. Until finally, every time Samson would rise up, your Bible said he would shake him. And his power would come. Until finally, he said, my power lieth in the seven locks of my hair, in my covenant, in my vow. And Delilah took his hair. And Samson, hearing Delilah say, the Philistines are upon thee, stood up and shook himself. That's what the church is doing right now, shaking ourselves. We're shaking ourselves. The saddest words in your Bible are these. And Samson knew not that the Spirit of God had already departed. Presence departed means judgment delayed and we're under the delusion that we can live the way we want to live and act the way we want to act and say what we want to say and do what we want to do and drink what we want to drink and go where we want to go. And And say, well, nothing's happened to me yet. 
Right now, the Spirit of the Lord is coming back to the church. There is a remnant church. Oh, I feel it now. I said there's a remnant church. There's a group that aren't satisfied with the status quo. There's a group that want to return to paths to dwell in. There's a group that wants to repair the breach. There's a group that wants to pray like we used to pray. Shout like we used to shout. it. Pray and praise and rejoice and preach like we used to. Your Bible in Isaiah chapter number 58 records these words. Cry loud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. Verse 12, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. They shall raise up the foundations of many generations and shall be called the repairers of the breach and restorers a paths to dwell in the word restore is the hebrew shub it means return to the starting block john 8 51 says he that will keep these sayings of mine shall not see death the word keep means to chaperone as one would his virgin daughter we got some stuff we're supposed to be protecting and we have watched the adversary come and steal cardinal doctrines out of the bridge of truth, which is the only way for lost, helpless, hopeless, dying, desperate, depraved, destined humanity to get back to God. And somebody's got to help me build a bridge. Is anybody going to help me tonight? The first thing they've stolen lies on many of your laps. It's called the Bible. I want to get real deep with you right now. The B-I-B-L-E. That's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. One prominent theologian recently stood behind his pulpit and on his radio broadcast announced, I am a liberal in theology. Of course, I do not believe in the virgin birth nor in the old-fashioned doctrine of substitutionary atonement, nor said he, do I know any intelligent Christian minister who does. His name, Theodore Parker. Hey, Teddy! Teddy! The Bible is the oak of God planted in the forest of eternity entwining its roots around the rock of ages and far better men and women than you and I have pillowed their head on it in their dying hour the Bible said let God be true and let every man be a liar God asked Jeremiah what do you see he said I see a rod of an almond tree blossoming and bearing fruit in the middle of the winter God said you've seen well I will hasten after my word and perform it somebody shout hallelujah, hallelujah. I think this is called a back to the Bible conference. It would be nice if we got back to the Bible. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. That book does not fluctuate. The current understanding of intellectual theolo theology that that book does not fluctuate with the hymn lines of Hollywood that that book does not change and only in that book do we find out who Jesus really is that book has stood because it is accurate in its prediction a man stood up and said it's full of contradictions i threw it out on the table in front of him and said show me one i had the privilege
privilege of being in the former Soviet Union. Three days after the failed coup of Mikhail Gorbachev, I stood behind a pulpit with microphone in one hand and Bible in the other in the 22,000 seat linen sports arena constructed for the Olympic Games. I, I stood there with an entire battalion of the Red Army spread out in front of me and I began to say to them, Stalin came and went, Marx came and went, Lenin came and went, but the very book they sought to ban still stands today to preach the funeral of every man that rises in voice in opposition to it. Don't hang your head about the Bible. I told that bunch of Russians, I said, don't ever, don't ever let them take it from you again. Let them take their, your land. Let them take your home. Let them take your cattle. Let them take your livelihood. Let them take your clothing. Let them take anything, but don't let them take that book. Make them pry it from your dead, cold fingers. Don't give it up. It is the word of God. It is the in infallible, indestructible, undeniable word of the living God. Somebody praise him. <laughs> Who is Jesus? That book will tell you. Because in Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our high priest. In Numbers, he's a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. But over in Deuteronomy, he's the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, the captain of my salvation. In Judges, my judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he is my kinsman redeemer. Somebody shout in this building tonight. Ruth, my kinsman redeemer in 1st and 2nd Samuel. He's my trusted prophet in Kings and Chronicles. He is my reigning king in Ezra. He is my faithful scribe. <laughs> Nehemiah, the rebuilder of the broken down walls of human life. And Esther, he's my Mordecai. I'm going to preach from one they don't like. They don't like this one, Bishop. It's called the book of Job. I'm tired of wheat, need milk, soft milk, toast, evangelicals. I'm tired. Belly aching, bawling, whining, crying Christians. Tired. Look at Job. I know no slick-haired, shiny-shoot evangelists want you to look at Job, but I want you to look at Job. Look at him. Oh, I want to know him. Job is not upset because his baby's diaper didn't get changed right in the nursery. Job's not even mad at the preacher. He don't even have one to be mad at. Sit down. Look at him. You bunch of lazy, backslidden, plucked up, doublet, dead by the roots, Christian. Look at him. God's word will stand up for itself. You don't have to make excuses for it. Look at Job. His houses are burned. His children aren't sick with the flu. They're dead. Not one of them, all of them. They're buried and their graves are fresh. He doesn't have any Advil, no bear, no Tylenol, no Nuprin. He's got a piece of broken pottery. And with that, he's scraping his boils. I don't know how good that would stand up in your conference. He's scraping his boils. He's got no preacher, no prophet. He's got no Sunday school quarterly. No Matthew, no Mark, no Luke, no John. Written in the second millennium before Christ, the oldest book in your Bible. Look at him. He's sitting on the ash heap of wreck and ruin. Everything that he has is gone. He's got no Trinity Broadcasting Network, no Charisma Magazine. He did, however, have a few friends. 
And his wife, in an act of mercy, came to him and said, Job, why don't you just curse God, hurry this process along, and die? But here, Job, I can't do it because I know something. He didn't say I could ask somebody. He said, I know something. I know my Redeemer liveth, and in my flesh I shall see God, and though he slay me, yet shall I. After I preached that message in the Soviet Union, I went back to my bed and God said, I want you to go back to America and do what you did. We watched the first three people we prayed for, the least of which had been in a wheelchair 22 years. We watched all three of them get up and run out of their wheelchairs, run around the building. We saw, we saw over two thirds of the entire congregation give their lives to Christ and be instantly baptized in the Holy Ghost. They got up from the altar, went out in the street, men in red army uniforms, stopping buses in the middle of the streets of Leningrad and climbing on the bus and telling the story they just heard in that building and city bus loads of people getting on their knees on the bus and giving their lives to Christ. Nobody took them through the Roman road or four spiritual laws. They got what they came for. God, I came to preach tonight. I went back and laid down on my bed and God said, I want you to go back to America and do what you did tonight. I said, you mean the preaching thing? He said, no. I said, you mean the praying thing? He said, no. I said, you mean the baptism of the Holy Ghost thing? He said, no. I said, what do you mean? He said, I want you to do that Bible thing. I want you to hold up a Bible. America has forgotten what it is. I want you to hold up a Bible and tell America to get back to God. Are you in a hurry tonight? Because I'm not lathered up yet. Are you, are you doing all right? Look at your neighbor and say, are you all right? I only got one night. That's all they invited me. I'm still talking about the Bible. My ever living redeemer for I know my redeemer liveth but in songs he's the Lord my shepherd he anoints my head with oil and my cup runs over <laughs> shout ye he prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemy oh hallelujah in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes he'll be wisdom to you say wisdom In the song of Solomon, he's the lover of the bridegroom. In Jeremiah, in Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. Jeremiah, the righteous branch. Lamentations, the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the wheel that turns in the middle of a wheel. In Daniel, he's the wonderful four-faced man walking through the fiery furnaces of life and commanding the crackling flames that they do not kindle upon you. Hosea, boy, here's good news for some of you. In Hosea, he's the husband forever married to the backslide. But in Joel, he's my baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Amos, my burden bearer. Obadiah, the mighty to save. Jonah, my great foreign missionary. Micah, the messenger of beautiful feet. Nahum! The avenger of God's elect. Habakkuk, God's evangelist, crying, revive thy works. In the midst of the years in Zephaniah, he's my savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Haggai, he's the restorer of the lost heritage of Israel. Zechariah, a fountain opened in the house of David for sin and uncleanness 
And Malachi, the Son of God, arisen with healing in his wings. Matthew's Messiah, Mark's wonder worker, Luke's Son of God, John, Son of Man, Acts, baptizer in the Holy Ghost, Romans, my justifier, Corinthians, my sanctifier, First and Second Thessalonians, he is my soon coming king, First and Second Timothy, the mediator between God and man, Titus, my faithful pastor, Philemon, the friend that sticketh closer than a brother, Hebrews, the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, my great physician, for let them call upon the elders of the church. Let them anoint them with their oil and pray the prayer of faith and the faith. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise them. Peter, my great shepherd, first John love, second John love, third John he still love. Jude, the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints. And in Revelation. I saw heaven open and he that sat upon a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. He was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood and his name was called the word of God and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in linen fine and clean and out of his mouth proceeded a sharp two-edged sword that with it he should smite the nations and he did rule them with a rod of iron. He did tread out the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And upon his vesture and upon his name a name inscribed, King of Kings. And you think we ought to get the Bible back in our doctrine? Somebody shout amen. amen. Then they've tried to take the born again experience from. Give me that plank. I didn't come to give you nothing deep. Most of you said deep, you're stuck now. Everybody wants to prophesy. Everybody wants to talk in tongues. Everybody wants a new revelation. Everybody wants to preach, but nobody wants to live right. is the born again experience I'm not talking about making a decision you make a decision at McDonald's whether you want a quarter pound or a Big Mac I'm not talking about a decision I'm talking about a conversion we have faulty conversions because we preach a faulty gospel Charles Finney said, did ever the weight of your sin go so far above your head that you could not bear to raise your head because of the weight of your own transgression against God? He said, if you have not, then under God do not call yourself a Christian for only a sinner needs a savior. Here stands God tonight with pardon in one hand and a sword in the other and bids the sinner repent and receive pardon or refuse and perish. Where is this gospel in America? Where is this gospel on ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox? You can't even find it on the Christian network. in you a cross. I'm not promising you prosperity. I'm pro promising you the Prince of Peace. Are you listening to me tonight? I didn't get in that way. We waste good tithe dollars on follow-up. This is a new term. Follow-up. What are we following up? When I was eight years old, Shirley Caesar, my mom and daddy being good Baptists, 
took me to a Pentecostal revival meeting with a woman preaching that we didn't even believe in. I'm coming now. Let's just go ahead and have church tonight. You want to do This choir made out of concrete block painted church basement blue some of you know where I'm talking about we didn't have no TV lights we didn't have no carpet on the floor we didn't have we had an old two by six bench with two by four legs holding it up we had a cord strung across the ceiling and the cord hung down and a 45 watt bulb screwed in the bottom of it because we couldn't afford a 60 watt. But oh! <laughs> that woman, <laughs> she'd been someplace talking to somebody. And when she came into that pulpit, she came like Moses with a face shining like a noonday sun. She began to sweat and preach and prophesy and dance and talk in tongues. I went to tugging on my mama's dress tail, eight years old. Tugging. Mama. Yes, son. Mama. Can I go to the altar? She was a good mama, still a good one. She asked the right question. She said, why? <laughs> why? I said, because I'm a sinner. And I need a savior. I made my way to that altar at eight years of age. That was 30 years ago. I never backflipped. And nobody ever come to me and said, you ought to go to church on Sunday. At eight years of age, I started looking in the newspaper, trying to find a revival meeting to go to. Honey, if you get what you came after, you'll come back for another drink. Stealth down the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem. Your eyes strain to see a figure standing on Pilate's parapet. You've been told it's him, but you can't believe it. You can't believe that it's he that walked on blue shores of the Galilee and manifested a mastery over demons and depravity and disease and the tomb of Lazarus even over death itself. You saw him walk on the water. You saw him stop the woman's issue of blood. Your eyes strain to see him as the sun begins to rise. You, you're amazed, but you agree it is him. It's him. He looks more like an animal than a man. His face beaten by 614 Roman centurions. They have wrenched the beard from his face. He has felt the lictor's lash and fallen under the weight of that cross three times. He lays out his arms and crosses his legs. They pierce his body. They swing him up between heaven and earth and the pitiful Palestinian sun beats down into his open wounds, gaping until it feels as though the very flames of hell itself have embedded themselves in the flesh of the only begotten Son of God. He cries, I thirst. They give him vinegar to drink. Mary Magdalene, who had watched him take his, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene, who had watched him take his first breath, now watches he takes his last. He exhales and says, it is finished. But just before he does, one crimson red rivulet of blood drops from his cheek and splashes to the sandy ground around Calvary's rugged beam and screams out from the dust of the earth which he had created, I'm doing this for you. 
one drop of blood. Just one. Just one red rivulet of crimson blood can free the entire human family of its plague. But it's not some other way, it's only by the blood. There's no salvation in a Shinto shrine, none in a Hindu cow, and you can lick a new age crystal till your tongue falls out. And it won't save you. But if you'll go to the cross, I said if you'll go to the cross, can I get a witness in this building? I say we get back to the blood. I say we get back to the cross. I say we get back to a born again salvation experience that hell can't shake. Is anybody in the building going to agree with me tonight? I'll tell you what else we need. We need the baptism in the Holy Ghost preached about a little bit. I'm not talking about your little Shandai, Rondai, tie my bow tie, take a ride of my Honda. I'm talking about something that your Bible said in Acts chapter 1 you shall receive power, 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 wonder working power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. I don't care how much you talk in tongues. Who have you won to Jesus this week? I don't care how much you prophesy and polish your armor. Who would you bring into this building tonight that needs a Savior? <laughs> Honey, there wasn't nobody ta taught me to talk in tongues. Nobody said, uh, now repeat after me. I was a Baptist boy. Baptist! 18 years old. Went into a building like this one and saw people talking in other tongues and knew they had something I didn't have. And I wasn't just about ready to leave there without it. That preacher prayed with me for two hours and 45 minutes after the service. He said, just take it by faith. I said, I don't want it by faith. I want it now. I want it now. I want it now. And when I said now, something hit me. I don't mean it touched me. I mean something hit me in the top of my head and like electricity shot out the bottom of my feet and something raised up on the inside of me that was bigger than me and started talking. Does anybody remember when first you received the blessed infilling of the baptism in the Holy Ghost? Do you remember? If you remember, get on your feet and shout about it. Some will turn you inside out. I'm talking about something make you love people you hate. I'm talking about something make you lay your habits down. I'm talking about a baptism of fire that'll burn the chaff out of you. I'm talking about God get you down there on the floor and roll you around for about five hours. And when you get up, you'll be different than when you went down. I'm talking about Terry. Terry, some folks say, well, we don't have Terry anymore. No more, no more, no more. Just get it right now. Just get it right now. Just repeat after me. Some of you need to tarry a while. Some of you need to wait a while. Some of you need to know what it means to get in the altar, not just pay a visit. I mean, get in there till you come out and you've been changed by the power of a resurrected Christ. Somebody praise him. I'm talking about tongue talking. I'm talking about prophesying. And that don't mean stand up in church and say, Thus saith the Lord, sister, yay, yay. That's not what we're talking about. The Hebrew word is naba. It means to rave like a madman and play the part of a fool. 
Anybody ready to get foolish for Jesus? Anybody ready to get skunk drunk on the Holy Ghost? When you get drunk on the Holy Ghost, everybody looks good. It's closing time. Are you listening to me? When you get drunk on the Holy Ghost, you lose your balance and don't know your way here. But you've got somebody to lead you. When you get drunk on the Holy Ghost, you love everybody. When you get drunk on the Holy Ghost, you're like an old drunk sitting on a bar stool giving away everything he's got. Everybody's his buddy and nobody's his enemy. My God, hug somebody right now in the Holy Ghost. Hug them. Everybody thinks America ought to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Shout now. Everybody thinks President Clinton and her husband too ought to get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Shout now. bunch I've ever seen. Prayer. Prominent theologian just released in his periodical said Professor Cursip was his name. Why not use a prayer wheel, he said, like Vanna White. Yeah, just spin the thing. He said we go through the motions of prayer but we do not and we cannot expect results. Prayer, said he, is doomed. <laughs> hey, Dr. Dumbbell, Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Call unto me and I shall answer thee and show thee great and mighty things thou knowest not. Listen, somebody's face get ready to grow. I don't know where we found this God that doesn't answer prayer. I've read the Bible from Job to Malachi, from kiver to kiver, and I've never found anywhere in there where there's a God that doesn't answer prayer. All I can find is a God that says you have not because you ask not. All I can find is a God that in Mark chapter 11 verses 22 to 24 says, Have faith in God. He didn't say rod. God. For truly I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain. How many got a mountain tonight? Say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. And shall not doubt in his heart. Didn't say anything about your mind. He said your heart. Your mind will tell you anything in the world. And your heart will scream louder than your mind. Because your Bible said the spirit of a man shall sustain all his infirmity. Your spirit can make your mind go south for the summer. Are you listening to me right now? Your mind can say it's not going to happen. Your mind can scream I'm never going to make it. And all the while your spirit saying you better not be telling us that we're already walking on the water. So I'm here to tell you tonight prayer works. For truly I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain be not removed that cussing to see and shall not doubt in his heart but shall believe those things that he saith shall come to pass. He shall have Therefore, what things whatever you desire when you pray, believe. believe you receive them and you shall. Didn't say you had them today. Said you shall have them. Didn't say you have them at this moment. Said you shall have it. It don't matter what you got right now. It only matters what you shall have. 
God's not a man that he should lie. He's not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. Does anybody in this building tonight believe in a prayer answering God? Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that bids me from a world of care. Bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known. And seas, where would we be without prayer? In seasons of distress and grief. And they looked at my little boy last week and said, incurable. When I held my baby in my arms and they said, no treatment. When I hugged his little body and they said, no hope. I walked outside that hospital building. I got in my car and closed the doors. And I escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Somebody shout amen if you know God tonight is hearing your prayers and answers. My heavenly Father knows the need before I pray. And tonight I rest assured the answer is already on the way. Are you tired yet? I'm doing all the work. tried to steal it Ted rather doesn't like Dan rather doesn't like it Ted Koppel doesn't like it Peter Jennings doesn't like it huh I said huh organized religion doesn't like it preachers don't like it and I could care less my Bible when I came when I was down in my basement and I opened up my Bible after I heard that news I opened up my Bible to Isaiah chapter number 53 and verse 5 and the very first word in the verse is surely 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 he hath borne our sicknesses and carried all our pain. Surely, where there's doubt concerning the perfect will of God to heal you, you'll never be healed. For healing is not a promise, it is a Calvary fact. If God hadn't wanted to heal you, he shouldn't have. There are only three questions concerning divine healing. The first asked in Mark chapter 1 by a leper. Came to Jesus and said, Will thou make me whole? The only place in the Bible anybody ever asked Jesus that. I wish these theologians would learn to read. Well, God's just trying to teach me something. Why don't you learn? Come on. Will thou heal me? And Jesus answered, I will. The second question, a man brought his son to Jesus. He said, I've taken my boy to your disciples and they couldn't do anything. Humpty Dumpty fell off a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. I always hated that when I was a kid. I always asked my mom, how come they didn't take Humpty to the king? What well, they messing around with horses and men for? Why they take him to the king? Talk to me, somebody. Jesus.
Jesus said, you took him to my disciples. He said, yes, but they couldn't do anything. I love what Jesus said. He said, don't worry about that. Bring the boy to me. Are you ready to take your situation to Jesus? Are you ready to take it to Jesus? The man looked at Jesus and said, if thou canst do anything, heal him. Have compassion on him. And Jesus pointed his finger under the nose of that man and said, it's not a question of what I can do. Only of what you can believe. For all things are possible to him that believeth. Family in my church had a little son born, head swollen larger than its shoulders this time last year. Inside, kept alive by artificial means, nothing inside that globe but water and fluid, no brain stem, not a brain cell. They brought that little blessed baby for prayer. Four weeks later, they brought him into the building, head normal size. They said, Pastor, here's the doctor's report. Handed me the doctor's report, showed the CAT scan, the one before where there was not a brain cell, not a brain stem. Now they showed me this one. And Cody's brain now had a brain stem, a fully formed brain, completely operational, completely functional, as normal as any child that has ever been born. Don't tell me God's not a healer. If he healed Bartimaeus, he'll heal you. Somebody say amen. I'm closing. It takes a while. I believe, Bishop, we had a greater impact on the world for the gospel of Jesus Christ when we preached these messages. America, America could care less what current gift you're operating in. They want a way out of their mess. And this is the way. Deliverance from demon powers. I don't care if you're bound by crack. I got a girl singing in my choir. Came to my altar, 98 pounds, three kids taken away from her by the authorities, on her way to jail, supporting a $300 a day crack cocaine habit. She knelt at an altar, a prayer came in on the inner city bus. Less than six weeks later, she was singing in the choir. That was two years ago, and she's not had a hit of crack since then. I'm telling you, Jesus is a deliverer tonight. This is it. This is it. I got a lot more to preach, but I only got one more plank. If anyone moves on me now, I'll call you down. I'm not playing. What are you in such a hurry to get back out to hell for anyway? We got the glory in here. We got the presence in here. We got the victory in here, the joy in here, the blessing in here. Where are you going? I'll tell you what we ought to hear a little more preaching about. Eternity. We hear a lot of preaching about how to get along in this world. Not a whole lot preparing us for the next one. There is a place called hell. I preached on it the other night in the Bahamas. The chief of police of the entire Bahaman Islands knelt at the altar and gave his life to Christ. I preached on it in Tampa, Florida. And the linemen of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers lined up at the altar and gave their lives to Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, people will respond to the gospel if they hear the gospel. Jesus preached nine times on hell and one time on heaven. How's that stack up with your pastor? Preacher's afraid to preach on hell. A prominent minister got me in a bathroom at a major convention. Looked me in the eye and said, I saw your program last week. I said, thank you. I don't deserve for you to watch it. I hope it blessed you. He said, well, you were preaching on hell. I said, is that right? I've been known to do that. 
He said, that, he said, you know, that's the most negative message in the Bible. I said, not for the 300 people that got saved, it wasn't. Help me tonight. Hell tonight is a reality. The smoke-filled corridors of the doomed and the damned is a reality. A place for the incarceration of the mortal souls of humanity where they will never die. No reprieve, no stay of execution, no letter from the governor's office. You say your friends will be there, you're wrong. Play, hell is a place of separation. Of darkness, hell is a place. You're not going to have a party. People say, I can only imagine what the prayers in hell would sound like. You're imagining something that is impossible. There are no prayers in hell. There's only the cursing and the damning of the name of God that people perceive sent him there. There's only the spewing of blood as men gnaw their tongues for pain. The Bible said that the smoke of their torment raised up under the nostrils of God forever and forever. Falling helplessly and hopelessly through the eternal ages of endless eternity. Grasping for something and nothing is there. Burning not only by the flames, but burning by the passions of desire that sent you there. By the way, what are you going to hell for? The Bible says, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Or what shall it profit a man? Shall he gain Charleston, West Virginia and lose his soul? Just as surely as hell is a reality, heaven is a reality. Heaven, you know, streets made out of gold. Heaven, you know, peace, joy, the throne of God. Heaven. There are people walking this earth tonight. who may never have the chance again to say yes to God and no to the devil. Yes to heaven and no to hell. The number one cry in eternity is, I never meant to be here. I never thought I'd end up here. When you flirt with that little thing at the office that's not your wife, the devil won't tell you where you're going to end up. When you take that first hit of crack, he's not going to tell you you're going to spend eternity in hell. But I'm brave enough and bold enough tonight to tell you that the adversary of your soul has nothing in mind except to drag you kicking and screaming hopelessly and helplessly into the darkened corridors of the devil's abyss to spend eternity. Your Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. Jesus is coming faster than a hoof ever struck the pavement or a wheel ever turned upon an axle. He's coming. It may be tonight. He's getting ready to slide his long, lean Galilean leg over a steaming white stallion. The crack of his whip's going to billow out like the crash of a thousand cannons. And faster than time, he's coming. And even if he didn't come, you may be in eternity tomorrow. I walked into a Sunday night service, World Harvest Church in Columbus, Ohio. When I got there, I walked to the second row where stood my uncle, Willie. 38 years, an alcoholic, not sober one day in 35 years. Until eight years ago, he stuck a bony finger up in the air and said, enough is enough. Embraced the gospel, was gloriously delivered, has never touched a drop, and sits in every service at World Harvest Church on the second row, praising God. I walked, I walked in to shake his hand. As I did, two people over from him, was a young man that weighed 320 pounds. His name was Freddie. He was my best friend. 29 years of age, wearing bibbed overhauls, had a beard, 
had his hands raised he'd been backslidden away from God but two weeks earlier had wept his way back into a relationship with Jesus Christ just because you were saved doesn't mean you are He stood on this Sunday night, his eyes closed, tears dripping through his beard as he worshiped the living God. I went to the pulpit, preached the sermon, had the altar service, left the building. That was at 20 minutes after 7 on a Sunday night. 20 minutes after 7 the next Monday morning, I got a call at my home. Pastor Parsley, we need you to come immediately to Grant Medical Center, downtown Columbus, Ohio, to the emergency room. That's the only words I heard. When you pastor several thousand people, you get those calls quite often. I jerked my clothes on as fast as I could because I'm not a shepherd that hates the sheep. I actually smell like them. I went, I went down to that hospital emergency room. They knew me. They met me at the door. They said, Pastor, we need you to go downstairs. I'd been in that hospital probably a thousand times. I knew the only thing downstairs from the emergency room was the morgue. They said, we need you to identify a body. I went down that one flight on an elevator. The elevator doors opened at the end of a dark, cold corridor of concrete block and cement. Lay a hospital gurney with a white sheet pulled over a body. I walked down that corridor with just myself and the hospital attendant. I pulled back the sheet and there lay the angelic face of my 29-year-old best friend. He was going to work on Monday morning. A young man had an epileptic seizure, came across the center line, hit him head on, and instantly he was in eternity. I preached his funeral. It was the hardest thing I'd ever done. But I preached about a place called heaven. I noticed a young man sitting over in this area. I couldn't help but notice him. Found out later he was 29 years old too. Drove an 18-wheel truck just like Freddie. He too had a beard and wore bibbed overalls to the funeral. Weighed 320 pounds. As I stood at the head of that casket, that young man came to pay his respects. He grabbed the casket, began to shake and tremble and weep violently. I asked him his name. He said, my name's Big Tom. I said, Big Tom, why don't you kneel down right here and give your life to Jesus and you can spend eternity with Freddie in a place called heaven. His knees began to buckle. I was sure he was going to pray. When suddenly his eyes glared at mine, he turned in a spin and ran out the back of that 5,000 seat building. I never saw him again. Fourteen days later I got a call at the church. Could we use the building for a funeral was the request. Certainly was the reply. Do I know the deceased? They said, you could. Do you remember a young man at Freddie's funeral named Big Tom? I said, how could I forget? They said he was driving his truck, had a massive heart attack, went over a concrete embankment. His truck burst into flames and instantly he was in eternity. I tell you that story for one reason. I made a covenant with God that I would the first night that I preached in any assembly. I'd tell you the story of Freddie and Big Tom. You see, I didn't come here tonight to show off my preaching ability. I didn't come here so you'd leave and say, isn't he a good preacher? I came for one reason. Somebody's going to hell and I want to stop them. I want to stop them. By the grace of God, we will. I'm tired of believers meetings with no altar call. Two young men, both 29, both 300 pounds, both bibbed overhauls, both beards, both truck drivers. Tonight they're both in eternity. One's in heaven, and by all accounts, the other is unfortunately in hell. The difference, one said yes, and one said no. One said today, the other said tomorrow. 
Flight 427 from Chicago to Pittsburgh, six and a half miles outside the Pittsburgh airport. The flight was normal. Conversation with the tower, completely normal. 15 miles of visibility. A northwest wind wafting at 15 miles an hour. The seatbelt signs are on. The flight attendants have been through the aisles. They've collected the cups. Men have put their briefcases underneath the seat in front of them. The tray tables are in their upright and locked positions. Ladies are putting their makeup on, fixing their lipstick. Little boys are thinking about going home and getting those uncomfortable clothes off and, and playing baseball in the afternoon. Women are thinking about what they'll make for dinner. Businessmen are anxious to get home to their families. When suddenly that aircraft veered to the left and 22 seconds later, every man, woman, boy and girl in that aircraft was in eternity if i had stood up bishop at 25 seconds and said make a decision now for jesus tomorrow's promise to no one they would have laughed me to scorn but tonight they would not laugh they have no opportunity but the door tonight is open to you everybody's standing nobody moving nobody moving reverencing the holy spirit in a moment i'm going to count to three i'm going to ask you to make that commitment you'll be glad you made when you stand before god in eternity right now all over this building all over this vast auditorium in this back to the bible conference isn't it time you got back back to jesus backslider hear me tonight Tomorrow is promised to no man. Today is the day of salvation. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. If you're unsure of your eternal destiny, when I say three, I want you to shoot your hand up in the air. We're going to pray a prayer. You'll be as sure for heaven as if you were already there, I promise you. In our church, in 11 weeks, we've seen 6,000 people give their lives to Christ for the first time. In the Bahamas, 3,000 in two nights. This could be your night. This is it. Hell's a reality. Heaven's a reality. Come on, young man. Come on. That's a way to get to Jesus. That's a way to get to Jesus. I'm counting to hell for anybody i'm counting this is your opportunity you can break the chains you can be free i'm counting one hands are going up all over this auditorium don't you be left out i break your power satan i curse you and rebuke you in the name of christ loose your hold on every captive two 22 seconds you may have loosed laced your shoes for the last time you may have walked out of your home for the last time. You may never make it back. This is it. This is it. I refuse to allow you to go to hell. On three, shoot that hand up in the air. One, two, three. Do it now. Do it now by the hundreds. By the hundreds. As quickly, as quickly as you can. We will wait on you as quickly as you can. Get into an aisle and come and join me at this altar right now. Come on. Come on, by the hundreds. Come on. If you've got to come from the balcony, come on. Come on. This is it. Break the chains. Here, there, there, there. Here, there, 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 there. Here they're coming and there. Back up this out. Come on, are you coming? Are you coming? Are you coming? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. This is your night. You can't do it in your seat. Come on, church, encourage them. They're coming from all the way in the balconies. Come on. 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 Tomorrow is too late. Today is the day of salvation. Eternity hangs in the balance. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I surrender all. There are at least 
least a hundred folks that are away from God right now at one time you knew him. You need to be at this altar. You've stood in your seat and said, all right, God, I'll surrender. You need to confess it publicly tonight. Publicly tonight. Come on, we'll wait on you. Nothing's more important. A healing line's not more important. This is it. This is it. Church, if you wish you made that decision one day earlier, shout right now. If you wish you came to Jesus one day sooner, shout right now. Still coming all over the building. We'll wait on you. Come on. Wait on you. Come on. Come on. We'll wait. Come on. Weeping. Weeping. Come to Jesus. Come on. Come on tonight. in the Holy Ghost you're not speaking in other tongues you don't feel power from another world loosed into your life come on get to this altar come on come on we gonna pray for it come on come on run if you have to get here get here come on tonight you need deliverance from demon power get to this altar come on make a move toward Jesus he'll move toward you come on come on I want to be free tonight, Pastor. Free tonight. Come on. Come on. I want to be free tonight. Come on. Get here. Get here. Throw yourself on the Lord. Throw yourself over on him. Throw yourself over on him. Say, here I am, Jesus. Here I am. You say, I don't know what to pray. Just say, Jesus, Jesus, come into my heart.
Don't you give up till you've got victory.
somebody else stretch your hands this way this dear precious lady she grabbed me by the leg she said pastor you got to pray for me she said I used to know Jesus but I'm back on the bottle and I can't stop she said I want God to free me hey, God. that's it that's it come somebody hey hey somebody praise him in this house praise him I said praise him against every addiction in this everybody get your hands up in the air we're not putting up with addiction in the name of Jesus Christ you tormenting foul spirit of hell I bind you and adjure you by the blood of Christ and from the top row of this building to this altar I command you to loose your hold on every man every woman every child in the name of Jesus Christ come out shout it
church. You might as well go to work right now. You ought to reach out and find somebody and lay hands on them. In the name of Jesus, speak authority over every enemy. Now the power of the Holy Ghost is victory time. It's devil chasing time. The blood of Jesus. The blood. Somebody got the Holy Ghost, the ghost, the ghost is loose, the power. 